listening to the Savoir Fair Audio Experience. Are you ready? The bass is louder. The Savoir Fair Experience is your guide to everything that has to do with lifestyle. From dating, rides, style, and entertainment. All brought to you by the editor of Savoir Fair Magazine, Robert White. Anything goes on this audio experience. So, let's go. It's still the best. Hello and welcome to the Savoir Fair podcast. This is episode five, and today we're doing our first call-in uh, guest, which was a new concept for us that we want to try out. And now our guest on the phone, we're going to introduce him real briefly, and then we're going to start a little Q&A, uh, is an excellent, amazing photographer who's been shooting for well over 25 years. He's worked with Sports Illustrated. He did some work with HBO, um, and now he's probably one of the leading uh, glamour and fashion photographers in the state of Florida, maybe even in the country. Uh, he's a good friend, and I'm super excited to have him on board with us. So, Anthony Nesty, are you there, sir? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Amazing. Hello. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. Excellent, excellent. So, what I want to talk about um, is a little bit of Photography, obviously, we want to talk about some of your experience and things that you've done in your career. Uh, but I think the other pieces I want to talk about is just the the man behind the camera a little bit more. Uh, and then we also have some, you know, some confidence and Savo Fair questions for you here at the end. Um, okay. So let's go back to the beginning of Anthony Nesty as a little boy. Um, yeah. Tell me a little bit about uh, you know your how you were raised and and growing up and and you know maybe your first insight to photography in general. Well, um, I grew. Uh, I was born uh, in Manhattan. I grew up in Manhattan, um, and I guess I was around 12 years old when my family decided to move out to Long Island. So we moved out there. Um, uh, like I said, when I was about 12 years old, and um, we just uh, got actually into the um, the whole idea of photography and creating and cameras and lighting and all that, I actually got into that uh, in my head as, at an early age. My, my father was a stagehand uh, for NBC in, in New York, and um, I would go with him quite a bit, you know, to work, and he worked at the NBC studios. Uh, he did quite a few shows, but mainly he was uh, on the Johnny Carson show, if you remember that name. Yep, I remember that name, yep. So, so you know, here I was, uh, a little kid, um, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, 13, going with him and hanging out while they were filming the show, rehearsal, everything. So that whole, um, that whole feeling... Of uh, of of the the entertainment industry kind of got into into my soul, let's say, and okay. I really uh, liked the whole idea of uh, of creating, of being around that whole industry. So uh, after college, I mean after college, after high school, um, a friend and I decided to come down to Florida, uh, over to St. Pete, Tampa area. And, um, it was one of the only places in the country that had a, uh, you know, close by on the East coast anyway, that had a television, uh, and, and, uh, and film production, um, uh, classes. And, uh, so that's what I did. And I did that one uh, for a couple of years down in Florida, then went back to New York, went to the new school and work, um, worked with some of the producers that were teaching at the new school. This one fellow, Robert Shanks, his name was, he was a, a ABC producer, and he helped me out a lot. He got me uh, as, as a freelancer to go on and work on some independent productions and things. So okay, that was cool. probably the beginning of it. Okay. All right, so the, so the big background is uh, really kind of came from what your dad was doing for work. Yeah, where he was. Yeah, where he was involved. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so how do you go from uh, being on the behind the scenes with your dad as a stagehand and stuff with, you uh -huh. know, uh, well, 
TV basically to well, digital photography or just in photography in general? What what got you excited about the stills and that aspect of everything? Well, I I really wasn't that excited about stills until um, I was working on an independent um, film production. It was a PR film for uh, for General Motors. <clears throat> and what we did is I was just one of the crew members that was kind of a Johnny do everything, you know, to help with sound, help with loading film, uh, just anything, you know, okay. it was uh, kind of a, a gopher job for $75 a day. But we went away for three weeks and we had an acting family, uh, mother, father, two kids in the new GM motorhome. So we were touring all through New England, stopping, doing all these setup stuff uh, uh, that was, you know, indicative to a PR film. Okay. So, so we just um, uh, had a meeting one night, and the producer said, "Oh, who has? Does anybody have a still camera?" And I said, "I do," and I was really the only one that had, that had a still camera because I, you know, I used to like taking pictures. So I always had a still camera. I had a little old Nikomat and a and a Yushika two and a quarter. <laughs> I don't even know those brands. I don't even know those brands. That was your that was your first camera then? Uh, well, the Nikomat was. The Nikomat. Yeah. I, I'm going to have to look that one up because I don't know what that is. <laughs> well, it's a Nikon. It's a Nikon. A Nikon, but, okay. Uh, but um, uh, so we, he gives me this number. He says, call this woman. She needs some still photos. So I said, okay. So she, she, I didn't know who it was. So this is, you know, before cell phones. Mm -hmm. So load up on quarters, go to a phone booth, and uh, call, call Detroit. And I speak to this woman, and she just said to me, we need pictures of the motorhome in a couple different locations. And she goes, I know you're going here and you're going there. She goes, can you, can you shoot this for us? And I said, yeah, that sounds you know, like I can, no problem. She goes, okay, she goes, the only thing is, the downside is I only have $2,000 in the budget. Okay. So I'm, my 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 jaw hit the ground, you know, and I'm like two thousand dollars. I said, uh, I said, yeah, that would be fine. Well, okay, you so know. I'm not I'm trying to I'm not trying to age you here, but but what year was this so that people kind of understand that two thousand uh, bucks was a freaking big uh, deal then? It was seventy four. Seventy four. Okay, okay. Yeah, seventy five. Yeah, that was a good payday then. Sorry. That was a good payday in seventy four. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the seventy five dollars a day was a good payday, you know. <laughs> yep. But. Uh, uh, but anyway, so I, you know, I said, you got to be kidding me to myself. I said, I can't believe still photography can, you know, can demand this kind of, uh, kind of money. But then when I realized, you know, you're selling copyrights, you're doing this, you're doing this. So that's why they, you know, the money is where, where it's at. So, uh, I did the shoot. Everything was fine. I started talking to my wife afterwards when we were back home. And I said, I think I'm going to invest in some more still equipment. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. And um, I had a, uh, we lived in Great Neck at the time in New York. We were just married. And um, there was a, uh, a fellow who opened this uh, pretty unique concept, uh, which I think not, even now it would go over really well. It was called, um, it was called Photographic Pleasures. And what it was, it was a storefront and in the back room, he had about 12 dark room enlargers set up. Okay. So, so you would, um, you know, you would rent the enlarger and the space and he had all the tray. You would bring your own paper, your own chemistry, you know, of course your negatives. Yeah. And you would just rent the space on an hourly basis, go back there, you know, and, and print black and white. And he also had a little, uh, teaching workshop, you know, that he would do a couple days a week. And um, his name is Steve Rosenbaum. And then Steve actually, you know, when he left that and decided to move on, he became the uh, managing editor for Peterson's Photographic Magazine out in, uh, out in L.A. Okay. And Steve just, you know, he just kept climbing the ladder and he just is doing really well. And he's one of my, one of my really good friends to this day that I still stay in touch with. Awesome. So Steve right now has a, a PR company out of New York 
and he does the PR for um, also W uh, the PPI uh, event in Vegas. He, okay. he handles yep. that every year for them. But he also has uh, photographic clients. You know, some software companies. You had camera companies, tripod companies. You know, all these different photographic uh, accessory uh, uh, companies that he would do the PR for. Cool. So uh, we're still in touch, and we still kind of work together mm -hmm. every now and then. And uh, Steve's a great guy. So, so that was my kind of uh, uh, initiation into okay. uh, still photography. Yeah, which was a, an amazing opportunity and a great payday. So, did you did you travel a little bit with that project? You had to go on the road a little bit. With what? To go and the, shoot the uh, RV and stuff, were you kind of on the road a little bit for that project? Well, we were on the road for three weeks. I mean, we, oh, did, the okay, okay. we did the film, and then, uh, you know, it was on to the next job, you know. Okay, cool. So, so uh, but that's when I started, uh, you know, really getting into the still work. Okay, so you bought some new equipment. You found a place yeah. where you could do uh, some uh, getting your prints created. And then what was the next step after that? Because the next know, step after that was... Uh, uh, you know, uh, developing a portfolio. Okay, uh, good. Yep. And I had pretty much everything in there. You know, I had product shots. I had some head shots, some model, what I considered at the time, you know, model fashion-y kind of pictures, mm -hmm. a little bit of sports. So it was kind of a potpourri of, you know, of, of images in my portfolio. So um, my, uh, my cousin at the time, my cousin Dolores, she was the secretary to Dick Shap. I don't know if you know that name. I don't anybody know that who, name. Who knows uh, okay. sports will remember the name Dick Shap. He was one of the, you know, best uh, one of the top writers and and best interviewers. And his son, actually Jeremy Shap, went on to work for uh, ESPN. I think he might still be there. Awesome. But anyway, Dick Dick Shap uh, was the managing editor at the time for Sport Magazine, and she was his secretary. So. Just, you know, on a family get-together one, one weekend, she said, why don't you come up and meet our photo editor and show him your portfolio? And I said, well, I really don't have, you know, any sports in here. I mean, I had a couple local kind of high school football pictures and soccer picture. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, she goes, just come up and see him. You'll really get along with, uh, with him, you know. She goes, I think you'd like each other. So I said, all right, so call this fellow. His name is Kevin Fitzgerald. He was the photo editor of Sport Magazine at the time. I called him and uh, made an appointment, you know, get all shined up, new new, new suit on, everything. <laughs> yep, yep. I, I go in to meet him, and I kind of peek in the office. I see his name on the door. I peek in, and he's at his desk and from behind, and I see this guy with hair down to his shoulders, you know, dungarees, jeans, all but. <laughs> and not going to excuse me, Kevin here. He goes, yeah, that's me. I said, oh, boy, we're going to get along good. You know, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so Kevin was a free spirit. <clears throat> he was he was really uh, a great guy. So he looked at my work, and uh, he said, I like what I see. Um, he said, I know you don't have many sports in there. I said, but I, I'm familiar with sports. I played sports my whole life, you know, through school, you know, played yep. baseball, football. So I was familiar with the rules of the games and everything. So um, what he did for me was uh, it was pretty cool. He told me he would give me credentials to go to the Giants game, the Jet game, the Knicks game, any you know any sporting event in the New York area that I wanted to go to. He would awesome. he would give me the credential, but also he would. Um, give me a list of names. So if the Mets were playing the Cardinals, I would give a little list of, you know, a couple of guys' names from each team. So I would concentrate on them. You know, during batting practice, I would do headshots. Mm -hmm. During uh, the game, I would concentrate on some action. So I, I would shoot the, the, uh, the people that he wanted, and he was, uh, he was gracious enough to process the film. So I would send wow. the film in. He would process it pull the pictures that he he would like to use for publication, you know, down the road. And it was a monthly, so, you know, things were done in, way in advance. Right. So he would pull what he wanted to pull, print some stuff, and when he would use something, I would get paid. And at the time, you know, the, the space, everything was, was judged by space rate. And I think back then, 
you know, maybe a full page was like, I don't know, 150, 200 dollars, and then derivative of, you know, down to maybe 25 dollars for a small picture. Okay. So, so that's how I would make some money. Wow. Um, then I did that for a few months, a good, you know, a good six, eight months. And then he started giving me work. He started saying, Hey, uh, the Dodgers are coming to play the Mets. We need, uh, we need Davey Lopes. I remember this is one of the first ones I did for him. Uh, he goes, we need some shots of Davey Lopes, who was, a uh, um, an infielder for the Dodgers. Okay. And, um, and, uh, he goes, I think the, his family is supposed to be there because uh, he was from New York area. So his family was supposed to be there. So get some shots of him and his family. So at uh, the beginning of the game, I go meet him you know, during batting practice, introduce myself, tell him what I'm there for. And I said, yeah, we got to get some shots of your family. I said, are they here? He goes, they should be. He says, there's, there's like 40 of them. I said, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> So anyway, needless to say, at the end of the game, we met outside, um, you know, by the entrance, the press entrance, and uh, there was, you know, like 30 people plus him, and, you know, we got everybody together, did a big family group shot, and Very cool. and, uh, and the magazine loved it, and, you know, pretty much that was it. I was on my way to actually getting yeah. paid for work. I mean, you were shooting, you were shooting professional sports players. Right out of the gate, pretty much. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So already involved in that world, which is pretty wild. So yeah. how did it advance to um, going from Sport Magazine to Sports Illustrated, and then how did the HBO thing come into play? Well, I'll, I'll tell you that, too. It's all related pretty much to um, people you meet and people who move on in their work. Yeah. So now, so now Kevin leaves – sport magazine after a couple of years and actually becomes one of the uh, photo editors at sports illustrated. They had awesome. a slew of photo editors and each photo editor had different sports that they would handle, you know? Okay. So, so now I stayed working at sport magazine for oh, over a year, you know, working with them. I didn't work for sports illustrated then right off the bat. So a couple of years, go by maybe a year and a half goes by and uh, i'm always in contact you know with kevin touching base we were friends you know at mm -hmm. this point so he goes um we just got a new photo editor at sports illustrated and he's looking for new talent he says why don't you come up and show him your work now at, at this point i've developed a pretty good sports you know portfolio oh yeah right so, yeah so, so Kevin goes, you know, make an appointment and then call him and get an appointment. So it, it happened to be John Dominus. Now, I don't know, you know, photography people, if you Google the name John Dominus, he was one of the icon photographers of, of Time Incorporated. Um, oh, wow. So he just uh, implored me that he was now a picture editor at, at SI. So <clears throat> anyway, so I make this appointment. And I'm like kind of, you know, anxious and, and nervous and thrilled and everything at the same time, all these emotions. So I go meet this guy, and he was the most pleasant person I've ever met in this business so far. You know, the guy was just wow. amazing. Great, great, great photographer, great person, understood everything. So he just... Uh, he looked at my work, and this is, you know, back in the day, you didn't come in with an iPad and show your work or say, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah right, right. A website. You know, you had a, a portfolio with 8x10, 11x14 images in that you would, that he would, you know, look through like a book. I mean, that's yeah, right. the, the definition of a book. Good old th three-ring so, binder. <laughs> yeah, so he, would, he was, you know, looking through everything. I must have had about maybe 20 or so pictures in there. So he looks at all the sports, he looks at everything, and uh, closes the book, and he goes, very nice, because I really like your work. I said, oh, oh, thank cool. you very much. I said, I'm you know, a big fan of yours also for years, you know, so I kind of had to drop that nine. Yeah, yeah. And then, <laughs> uh, and then he goes, uh, so what are you doing Saturday? <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> you know, well, what's up? He goes, well, we're doing a story on the up-and-coming Heisman Trophy candidates that year, and George Rogers, this was 1980 now, so mm -hmm. George Rogers was one of the Heisman Trophy candidates. Uh, he played for South Carolina, 
And he goes, uh, I'd like to send you to South Carolina and cover George Rogers for this story. And I said, I would be, I would be honored. I said, this would be great. Wow. So, and he tells me, he said, it's just a column. So now back in the day, they would tell you if we're shooting color or you're shooting black and white. And he uh -huh. goes, this is just for a column. So just shoot black and white. So I said, okay, no problem. Go to the stock room, go get your film, go get some equipment. If you need extra equipment, uh, go see uh, Nina, uh, the secretary up there at finance. Uh, she'd give you an advance check uh, oh, wow. for some cash and uh, call travel and go over the, your plane, your plane reservations with them. And like, everything was just like, you know, like clockwork so, right there. Ready to rock. Done. It was yeah. like, you know, wow. it was amazing. You know, everything was, you know, all those particular little things, all of a sudden now we're done for you. you yeah. Know? All um, in house though, right? Like the whole team that you just mentioned was all part of the staff of sports illustrated. So yeah, well, Sports Illustrated or Time Incorporated, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's all, it's all in the Time Incorporated. Okay. So so now uh, I'm like, oh, this is amazing. So I uh, go home. I tell my wife. We were like, you know, jumping for joy. I can't believe I'm going <laughs> to, you know, start, you know, do a job for Sports Illustrated. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that, that, that one job in 1980 uh, – turned into 17 years of wow. working with them. That's amazing. So um, it became a steady gig, mm -hmm. and every every week, you know, you were on to something else pretty much. Wow. Uh, you know, you had an off week here and there, and, you know, I would work for other clients every now and then. So a lot uh, of travel so and a lot of sports places. coverage, right? Sorry? A lot of travel and then a lot of sports coverage. Every, every week. I mean, football season, the routine for me basically was uh, leave Friday, fly to, let's say, uh, uh, Notre Dame, do do a college game at Notre Dame. After the game, uh, go to the airport, ship the film, and then get on another flight and get on a flight to, let's say, Dallas, and then do a cowboy game. Wow. You know, that's Sunday. And then after that game, get on a plane, fly back to New York, bring the film into Manhattan, mm -hmm. drop it off at our lab, because we had the 20th floor on the Time Life building was just a, uh, it was all the lab. Uh, wow. That's where everything came in from every magazine that the, that the company had. So they had their own lab, their own staff of technicians. It was, uh, it was the best there is, you know. Yeah, it's uh, awesome. It was, uh, you know. Yeah, like it sounds I had, pretty I, incredible. I had, I, had, I had a real country uncle, and he used to say, you're shitting in the high cotton now. <laughs> so, so, so I said, yep. So that's the way it was. And 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 that went on for a long time. And then my uh, my, my buddy Kevin, who, who uh, worked there, uh, he was doing basketball, and he was doing boxing. So I was doing some fights for... for uh, SI. So what happens is now a couple of years go by and uh, Kevin, I guess it was about 1980, I want to say 84 or so, he, he leaves SI and he goes to HBO. So now he's one okay. of the picture people at HBO doing the publicity. So I didn't start working for HBO until the, their boxing program, I guess it was about 86 or so. So their boxing program got popular and they started signing fighters. And, you know, that's when they signed Tyson and all these other, you know, big, big fights. So they needed someone to shoot boxing. So he asked me if I would do it. And I said, yeah, I'd love to. And mostly everything was in Vegas. So there was trips to Vegas constantly. So, um, I told SI what I'm doing, and they said, really? I said, well, let me talk to Kevin, because what SI wanted to do, see, HBO didn't need the film as news. Sports Illustrated, as you know, was a news magazine. Right. So it was, it was uh, you know, weekly. So if there was a fight in Vegas, a big fight in Vegas, uh, that I was doing for HBO, and Sports Illustrated had a news interest in it, 
they would uh, tell Kevin, hey, we'll pick up Nesty's film. We'll do the processing. We'll look through the images. If there's anything that we want to use, you know, of course, you, they, we both get credit. Yep. And, and then you guys get all the film back. And that was fine for HBO because that was, uh, you know, if I'm shooting 40 rolls of film, that's, you know, and almost $1,000 worth of processing that they don't have to go for. Wow. So, so now um, I would get pictures in the magazine. Uh, I would get credit. I would get paid for them. But then also they were paying me $500 just to look at my film. Wow. To give, to give them the option to look at it. So they're paying me 500 Then I'm getting paid my normal scale. Uh, to go out to Vegas to do a fight for HBO. So, you know, making some gravy on the side. Yeah, yeah. So it was great. Two I mean, birds with one that, stone, I kind of. I did that for years. Mm. I mean, I was always going to Vegas, either for SI or for HBO, to shoot wow. these fights. So, um, I, I, I went to Vegas so much that I got audited one year, and my, my accountant goes, you're not going to believe the only thing they wanted to know is why you go to Vegas so much. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> It was pretty funny. But anyway. Wow. So, uh, I don't know if they thought I was laundering money for the, the mob. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so, so that, was, uh, that was the start of my relationship with HBO. So one thing led to another now with HBO. Um, I started doing concerts. I started doing deaf comedy jams. I started doing all the comedy shows and the music concerts that they would have. Mm -hmm. uh, I would shoot all that stage presence and some setup stuff uh, with some of the comedians, you know, John Legazamo when he started. I mean, we did so much stuff together. Um, wow. Just it, it, so many people, you know, um, over the years. Wow. Uh, then, then I got into working on the uh, movie sets. Uh, that happened kind of by chance because they were doing a movie with Mickey Rourke out in New Mexico um, called The Last. I believe it was called The Last and Mickey Rourke. And, okay. and they, the poster picture that they wanted was this shot of the posse coming over the hilltop with the smoke flying from the horses and all this stuff. You know, that was their idea. The photographer they had on set doing what they call unit photography. Uh, did not know how to shoot action, did not have the right equipment, you know, long lenses to shoot sports or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, they asked me to go out there to just to shoot that one scene for this poster. Wow. And um, I said, okay, great. So now I go out to New Mexico, I'm supposed to shoot the scene on a Tuesday. It gets pushed to Wednesday. Wednesday happens, it starts to rain, so they push it to Thursday. I was out there a week before I shot the scene. <laughs> okay. So in the meantime, in the meantime, I'm shooting all this other material. I'm shooting the headshots of the actors. Steve Buscemi was on, on, on it. Uh, uh, um, uh, Mickey Rourke, uh, Dermot Mulroney. Um, these guys are just starting out. Dermot Mulroney was just, I mean, he wasn't even known, you know, now he's a big star. Um, um so there was, you know, there was quite a few of, uh, uh, you know, people in supporting cast uh, that were really cool. Ted Levine. Uh, wow. Ted Levine was... Um, what do you think are like, um, I mean, not to cut you off, but what, what do you think uh, your most iconic stuff from HBO is uh, photography-wise? Like the, I know that, you know, following you on Facebook and Instagram and seeing some of the stuff that you kind of, um, <clears throat> you share there, like The Sopranos was a huge deal. And a lot, yeah. you have iconic shots of the cast from Sopranos. The Sopranos, you know, the Sopranos happened, uh, it was kind of funny how all that came about, but, you know, uh, but that's how I got started with the movie industry, doing stuff like that. So, I, you know, okay. I got, I'm getting all these other pictures in the meantime, all the time I was there and sending them back and the people at HBO were going, how are you getting these pictures? So they didn't, you know, I, I, I don't like to talk about, like if if uh, if I'm with an athlete, I'm not going to talk about football or baseball. We talk about something else, you know. We talk about fishing. Oh, right. so I yeah, yeah. You know, get get more to a personal level with them. That's that's the way to do it, and you gain their trust. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> Mickey Rourke found out that I was the boxing photographer, and him being a fighter, you know, Mickey Rourke used to used to love boxing. He was even I think he even had a few pro fights. Mm -hmm. So the next thing I know, I'm in Mickey Rourke's trailer. 
smoking cigars, drinking brandy, and talking about boxing. <laughs> awesome. You know, so <clears throat> it was uh, it was one of those things, and and that's uh, that's how I got these extra pictures. You know, we'd be outside, and I'd tell you, Mickey, can you you know look at me over here, or can you stand over here, or you know, and he was complying, no problem. Yeah. But the other photographer there, I guess, didn't have what you call the chutzpah to do that. You know. Okay. So anyway. So, so I'm getting all these extra pictures. They loved it. So now they start sending me on other jobs, you know, and, uh, you know, death comedy jams, you know, starts and, uh, and, uh, it was in the Apollo and, oh, who are we going to send to the, no one, you know, the other photographers didn't want to even go to Harlem to do the Apollo. I said, what are you crazy? I said, I'll go, you know, <laughs> right. So, you know, so I'm, I'm up in Harlem and we shot all the death comedy jams with Martin Lawrence and, and Russell Simmons at the time, and it was just, it was great, you know, meeting all these, these comics. So, um, that was a great time. So then, you know, things just, my, my Sports Illustrated stuff kind of, you know, took a back seat now to the stuff I was doing for HBO. But I still did sports for HBO, and not only the boxing, but I did 14 Super Bowls in a row for HBO, because they had the Inside the NFL show. So wow. I, I did all the Super Bowls for them. I did Wimbledon a couple times for them. So, you know, there was other sports that I was, you know, still involved in um, through HBO. Wow. So so then, um, you know, we moved to Florida. I'm down here. I'm still working, you know, flying here, flying there. And then uh, uh, I get a call from this girl, um, uh, Susanna Martin. She was the head of uh, HBO. Uh, at the time, and she goes, uh, we had a new show. Um, I think you'd like this show. I think you're made to order to really work on this show. I said, really? She said, yeah, I'm going to send you the script, and I'm going to send you the pilot. And I said, okay. So hmm. she sends me The Sopranos. And I watched the pilot, and I was like, you got to be kidding me. This thing, <laughs> is, this thing is amazing. This is going to be like, you know, a cult. Thought. I knew it. Right oh, yeah, that. yeah. And I took it to my friend's bar on Long Island, you know, a uh, you know, typical Italian bar. Uh, and um, we put it on in the bar. And it just, uh, the people went nuts. They wow. loved it. So um, I go to work. I said, yeah, I want to work on this show. She goes, okay, we're going to start. She goes, it's a union show, though. Now, I wasn't in the union. I wasn't in the motion picture union at the time. Okay. So they... Um, uh, she says, you have to join join the union. You have to go. I said, okay, call the union house. Find out that uh, it's the, there's a, a long wait to, you know, to get in the union. You got to go through all these channels and this and vetting and all this other BS. So I said, okay. Um, I said, you know, my dad was a stagehand for NBC. And the woman on the phone goes, she was. I mean, he was. I said, yeah. I go, what year was that? And I told her the years. <clears throat> and she kind of looked up the records. And she goes, your grandfathered in. No worries. Oh, thanks, Dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's all over now. He goes, that, that stagehand's <laughs> union that he was in at the time in, in, in the 60s, in the mm -hmm. 70s, that union became Local 600, which was the cameraman's union for Atsi. Wow, you know, for this for the uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, motion picture union. So I'm like, great. She goes, all you got to do is pay the uh, entrance fee. The you know, I called the vig. You know, you got <laughs> you got to pay the initiation fee. Yeah, right, right. Said, okay. She goes, well, it's fifty two hundred dollars. I said, good lord, okay. <laughs> that's a <laughs> lifetime so, membership, or is that like for one year? No, that's just no. That's to get you a card. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Then then you pay dues, you know, on a yearly. Okay. But, um, no. so I tell my wife, I go, oh, we got to hustle to try to get this money up now, you know? So my father-in-law steps in like he always did, helped us out. And, um, I mean, the $5,200, that was paid in a week of my union salary. Wow. So, you know, here I am on the set and, uh, making some great money. Mm -hmm. I'm on every day. We, we, we shot from Mondays through Fridays for six months. Wow. And I was, I was on every day for two years, over two years. 
So, so, uh, wow. so, so you know, we were, we were doing great. And that was uh, just it became an iconic show. Oh, it's yeah, just, definitely. It was amazing. And, and you know, my photos from that show uh, to this day are, you know, just the main signature images, it seems. Oh, yeah. That, uh, I, I think though, so, too. And that's... Even, though, even though the show went, you know, six years, I only worked it into the third year. But mm-hmm. my images from the very beginning were, the, you know, the ones that everybody wanted. Because they had Vinnie Pastore, who pussy, who was killed, you know, like after the mm-hmm. second year anyway. You didn't see him. So, uh, you know, just the, some great stories, great relationships. You know, Jim Gandolfini and I just hit it off. He was, he was the best. And um, it, was, it was really, really uh, not only a great experience, but probably one of the best experiences of my career, for sure. Wow. <clears throat> That's very cool. So, so the, the thing that we all know of you now, the Anthony of uh, you know 2019, right. is right. glam photography, shooting with models, uh, you know, living on the coast in Florida. This is kind of like a, I don't know, is this kind of like a, I mean, you're still pretty pretty prominent in the in the industry, still shooting, doing a ton of stuff, but it's, it's just a lot more relaxed for you now, right? Well, yeah, and I mean, I only. Uh, got into this uh, kind of second career, I kind of call it, my second okay. life in photography. I got into this because of my daughter, Jessica. Um, okay, explain you know, Jessica, that a little Je- bit. Huh? How does, how does that work out? You did it for Jessica. How's that go? Well, Jessica <clears throat> Jessica was a model for many years, you know, in, in New York and in Miami. Okay. And uh, she always wanted to start her own little boutique kind of agency. So she turned, I guess it was like 30 years old, and she, I don't want to model anymore, I want to do something else. So in that transition, she was approached by a friend who was uh, starting a magazine down here called Image Magazine. And okay. it, was like a, uh, it was like an Ocean Drive kind of template mm-hmm. magazine, um, but for Central Florida, because we were up by Daytona. We're like right in between Daytona, Jacksonville, Orlando is close. So that whole, you know, uh, uh, that whole triangle uh, was where the magazine was going to focus. Okay. And it did great, but they needed photography, and they didn't have money. They were, you know, getting money from advertisers, and bad. Can you shoot this? Can you do this? Can you work with this model? So <laughs> Jessica really initiated me into the whole fashion world. Okay. Um, even though I did a little bit before that, you know, I was uh, I was in Hawaii. I did Baywatch for two weeks, you know, shooting all their models. So, um, but that was different. You know, that was more more swimwear. Uh, right. Right. Now. With this magazine, it was fashion, some high fashion, some swimwear, some, you know, it was different things to do. So Jessica really uh, handled, she was the fashion director, and she handled all the styles. She was the one going to uh, uh, the designers, going to the department stores, seeing what's there, grabbing stuff. And then we would set up these shoots, and we would do these shoots. And... uh, and she basically, like I said, she basically was my uh, my mentor <laughs> to <laughs> to fashion photography. What know? I what I think is really cool about your family in general is that your son, your daughter, have kind of followed in your footsteps, and they both yeah. are doing photography. Like yeah. they're both yeah. excellent photographers at that. I mean, they're. They're doing amazing stuff. I've seen some of Jessica's work with celebrities uh, in New York yeah. City already. Um, you know, your son's doing amazing stuff. He's he's got an excellent eye for it too. So they kind of adopted that from you. Yeah, yeah. Like they say, the apples didn't fall far from the tree. Yeah, know? not at all. So, and, oh, go ahead. What were you gonna say? No, I was gonna say, and it's it, it's uh, it's to me, it's it's very humbling. You know, oh yeah, to yeah. See, to see the kids do so well and and you know take after. So with all these uh, all these photographers in your family, is that all you guys talk about over Thanksgiving dinner? <laughs> no shit, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, no. Uh, anything but no. that, I guess, is probably the. It's probably topic. the least we talk about. And what does your what does your wife think about all these photographers in the house? Uh, she's Marilyn loves it. She uh, okay. 
you know, she's a, she's a grandma three times now, so <laughs> that's her world. She's everyone's biggest fan, and then she just takes care of the grandbabies. Yeah, yeah, oh, I love that's it. her world. She loves the grandbabies, you know, so. Yeah, very cool. Okay. Yeah. So, <clears throat> all right, let's talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, the modeling world, because you're, you're in depth with this. You know, we were on the phone just last night having a little – little conversation about things um mm -hmm. you shot with so many different models you know a lot of these girls that you shot that were under the radar we, we could say have have really kind of launched some really positive careers and have become you know kind of forces in the modeling world yeah they have and and you know if you if you uh, take a look through my book you'll see that you know i mean a lot of the girls that i published in my in my book the, the amazon uh, amazon media published a book I mean, on Amazon, uh, uh, Amherst Media published okay. a book for, uh, with me, um, I guess a year, a little over a year now. Is and, that, uh, uh, that's, all the models I put in there, I put a lot of models. I mean, I put over 100 models in that book. That's Turning and, Heads, uh, right? And it's on, it's on Amazon. It's still doing well. You know, okay. It's called Turning Heads. Yep. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's doing well. So a lot of the girls that are you know, in my book, yeah, like you said, Quite a few of them broke through. Yeah, which yeah. Doesn't, doesn't happen very often, you know. I, I I equate modeling to sports in the sense that uh, you know my son was a baseball player for years, and he was a full Division One scholarship player right out of high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, so I see the athletes and what they go through. And I've been through the you know to these camps and to these tryouts. And it's like, you know, hundreds of kids, and they're all good. They're all good. And it's kind of like modeling, you know. Right. Uh, uh, you got to, if you do it, you have a passion for it, and, you, and you're good at it, you'll, you know, you'll yep. find the spot. Someone will find the spot for you. That's true. But I think uh, I think on that topic, too, is, <clears throat> you know, for those people that actually listen to our to my podcast, I did an, I did an entire episode um, about... Uh, professional models in general, and and and, and did an analogy based on baseball. So just I'm, I want to huh. kick some of these things around with you because I think this is right up the alley of what we're talking about now. So yeah. one of the things yeah. that I um, did analogy wise was you know baseball players as an example. They are young kids when they learn about baseball. They play in little league. They play in Babe Ruth or Pee Wee. They go to high school. They play in college, and eventually they become professional baseball players. But my downfall or what I thought was kind of a negative thing is that the modeling industry doesn't have uh, that same kind of uh, that scale where you're kind of going from one step to the next step to becoming something major. So, which is kind of unique, I guess, because that industry allows models that maybe are completely unknown to shoot with someone like you really that has substantial history in photography, knows what's going on, can shoot really amazing photos of them. And then all of a sudden they're like on the map. Like, you know, when, when Anthony shares, like for the listeners, when Anthony shares something out on social media, the frenzy around those photos is pretty incredible. Like that's some power that you've built for yourself, but the models, I, I have to give some credit here. I think some of the models that have launched pretty substantial careers have done that because you're on their resume. Mm -hmm. Well, so, you know, me and, um, you know, there's other photographers out there, too. I don't want to, you know. Well, I think you're, because, I think in your neighborhood, right? I mean, I got, I mean, the history we just talked about is pretty substantial. Like, Sports mm -hmm. Illustrated for all those years, HBO, The Sopranos, traveling around the country, shooting all these major things, getting paid the big bucks, really. Like, you were one of the elite photographers in the industry at that point. And, and now your focus has changed over to shooting models like you know for the models that are paying attention i guess it's worth it for you guys to go and get in touch with anthony and try to get some get on his schedule <laughs> um get some yeah, paid you know i mean as far as as far as affordability you know some people shy away because they think oh you know he's going to be too expensive yeah I, I don't i don't live in miami <laughs> so you know <laughs> if, if i was in miami yeah i'd be charging three times what i'm charging now right but, uh you know, but I'm not. So, and I do this, uh, you know, in my own, in my own space, I have a studio that we built on the back of the house and, and, uh, you know, I have a, we have the pool. I live on the beach, but the back of my house is on the, on the river, on the intercoastal. So there's mm -hmm. so many, I mean, there's so many locations just like outside my door. 
That's amazing. Yeah. And you're doing uh, you're doing some some workshops and some different events too to help yeah, other, do, to I teach photographers the skill, right? What I've gotten into more is you know workshops for photographers. Yeah. And I like doing the small workshops. I did bigger workshops where there were you know up to ten photographers and. You know, I started, actually, I started a few years back, uh, how I got into the workshops was working for American Photo Magazine. They hired me, and I worked with them for two years, and we traveled all around the country every month in a different city doing a workshop. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's how I kind of got it in my in, in, in my blood, you know, because I, I, I like this, you know. So I like instructing, I like showing people things that they don't know, and, mm-hmm. you know, that, that whole, like, wow factor you know, that they have, oh, wow, you know, that eye-opening experience is cool. You know, I like them seeing, I like seeing that. Right. So, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think the workshops that I do now, I kind of keep them small. I'll do one photographer, one-on-ones. I like the one-on-ones. Yeah. And we'll get a model. I got my assistant. I get one model, a hair, a hair and makeup girl comes and we just do it up. And the guy uh, who's uh, the student for the day, he gets taught all, you know, different uh, angles, different lighting setups. We do available light. We can do studio light. Mm-hmm. Uh, some guys just don't even want to do studio light. They just, I want to learn more about available light because a lot of photographers don't have the money to spend on all this equipment, you know, lighting equipment. Right, right. So we, we focus on just uh, uh, daylight, you know, and uh, my studio is set up uh, so that the, um, uh, when I built it, there's a lot of glass, it's got a southern exposure, it's got a lot of windows, so the light that comes in there is really cool, you know, very great oh, very light. cool. <clears throat> so, you know, it's, uh, that's what I enjoy doing when it comes to workshops, I like that. You know? Perfect. So, so- and now. We're thinking about we're thinking about doing something. I uh, have a great hair and makeup uh, team here, and we're thinking about maybe doing a model workshop. You know, maybe okay, with cool. photographers. Yeah. So we'll get we'll get a handful of models, handful of photographers for a couple of days over a weekend, and the models can learn posing. They can learn how to apply makeup. They can learn how to you know change their hair up a little bit. You know, on a shoot. Mm-hmm. Um, go over wardrobe, this and that. So that's you know that's an idea down the road that we're toying with. Okay, uh, very so. cool. So I want to just up, dump, uh, jump on a couple questions, a um, mm-hmm. couple more, and then you know, we can cut you loose. You can go shoot your next famous model. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's not until Friday. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, Friday's coming soon. So um, <clears throat> you know the Savo Fair brand in general kind of has been going through a revamp. We're kind of focused on confidence and um kind of being well spoken and being able to kind of control a room things like that you know from a photographer's perspective how important is confidence in a photography field like what i mean you you mentioned a story earlier where you were able to kind of go right up to you know some celebrities and be like hey come over here and pose let's let's do this like a little bit more directive but i think that's confidence as well because that's you being able to say, well, this guy's not going to ask you to do it, but I sure am because I want to have the best shots I can get. Is that, is right, that all part of it? Right. And, what's, and what's the worst that the, that the person could say is no. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, so you know you, you know better off than where you started, you know? True. But, uh, uh, you know, you'll be surprised how many will say yeah. Or they say, okay, you know, can, you, can we do it in five minutes or whatever, yeah. you know? So most of the celebrities that I've encountered are, are really – fine with that you know they're open to it right and i think that uh, you know i've had some celebrity encounters too in my brief career as a publisher um and so you know i think i think it's kind of the same aspect you, you know you treat them like human beings you don't really kind of turn into a fan um you like you said you talk about anything but what they're really into you know if they're a baseball player we're going to talk about fishing uh right. build rapport um and then have that relationship with them and and i think that's how you build a, a friendship and a relationship over time is eventually that they know that you know you're good people you're not there to harass them and they'll give you what you're looking for when it comes to the right photography shots right yeah, very cool. All right, so I want to close this out by giving you an opportunity to tell everybody where they can find you, how to get in touch with you. Um, I know you have anthonynestyphotography.com, but drop all your social links for me here. What do you got? Uh, well, Facebook, 
um, we have uh, there's a couple pages. I have a um, I have a workshop page um, that is. I'm just gonna. <laughs> hold on, I just want to check it, make sure I get yep. it right. Hold on, it's uh, it's called Beach House Beach House Studios and Workshops. Okay. And that's on Facebook. All right, perfect. Right. And we can so tag Beach that House, one in Beach the description. House studios and workshops. Um, then I have, you know, there's a fan page, Anthony Nesta Photography, and there's another page on Facebook that's more like a personal uh, page, but then turned into like a business page. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, you know, at least I can communicate with uh, with models and and, and yeah, such. right. Um, so that's just that's just Anthony Anthony Nesty. That's just okay. my name on uh, on Facebook. I know you're rocking uh, Instagram. What do you got going on over there? Instagram is uh, Nest Picks N E S T P I X. Okay. On Nest Picks, uh, I, I don't do Twitter anymore. Okay. Uh, and then there's my website. Just you know, W's Anthony Nesty Photography. Awesome. Uh, that's the you know the main website. And I want to plug out there real quick that like. <laughs> Just Google me. Yeah, Go that's Google. pretty much all they need to do. Go on to Google, put in Anthony Nesty, and 25 years of excellent photography shows up. Go over to Amazon, look up Turning Heads. I want you guys to go buy that book. I'll put a link. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, you're going to see a link down in the description for Turning Heads. Go cool. buy the book. Um, support your support this man. He <laughs> He's incredible. I can't. I, I don't even have a copy of Turning Heads. I want to get a copy and see what's uh, going on well, in there. You know, you're going to tell you, you're, you're toying with this trip to Florida for how long now? So. I know. I mean, we have talked about that. We definitely want to do a collaboration. I, I don't know why I'm hesitant to go to Florida because in New York, winter's about to set in, and I know I'm going to be dreading the cold weather. Um, so maybe soon I'll get down there and we can do some stuff. I mean, Savo Fair and Anthony Nesty have had a good relationship for since day one, really, since we launched this brand. But for many years, this has been a good friend of mine. Uh, it's a man I respect highly. And I think all you guys need to go out there and follow him on Facebook, Instagram. Go buy the book and check him out and stay in touch. Like his career is... I don't know. He's got his second coming right now, right? So you're still kind of yeah, there's still much. so much more coming in the next couple of years. So uh, I've and definitely now, and now we're gonna have a pretty unique cover on Savo Fair coming up. Yeah, we're not gonna mention yeah. too much about that, but I can tell you that I'm I'm we're freaking excited about that one. So 2020 yeah. is gonna be a big year for Savo Fair and Anthony Nesty and some of the the many folks that he gets to do some photography with. So I'm excited about that too. Yeah, very cool. All right, cool. sir. Well, I'll let you go. Enjoy the rest of your day, and thanks for uh, coming on and being my guest. No problem, but I appreciate we'll it. We'll talk and, soon. Uh, send me an email with your address so I can mail that book out to you. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Perfect. Thank All you right. very much. Thank you for listening to the show. Please take a minute to head over to www.savfair.com and subscribe to our publication.